Buying your home can be a daunting task, especially if there's no one or nothing to guide you through exactly what needs to be done and how to do it. Most home buyers, and not only first home buyers, get the order of the steps wrong, too wrong. And when things get out of order, mistakes happen, very costly mistakes. So today we're giving you a quick guide to the 10 essential steps to buying your first home. Welcome to Your First Home Buyer Guide, the podcast for first home buyers who want to move it along and become homeowners. But most importantly, it is for you to become an educated home buyer. I'm Megan and that was Veronica. We're both buyers agents and probably old enough to be your mum. But that's a good thing because between us, we've got over 45 years experience to share with you and market loads of stories about avoidable mistakes. Together, we're going to make sure you get unbiased and real information you can rely on. Allow us to guide you on your home buying journey. We want you to become an educated home buyer so that you can stop looking for your first home and actually become a proud homeowner. We've got loads of great tips for you in this episode and if you'd like more useful tools head over to the website homebuyeracademy.com.au and there you'll get access to our free mini course how to price a property like a professional. You will also find the holy grail of home buying education your first home buyer guide the online course for people who want to become educated home buyers. We created this for you to help you get on the right path to home ownership for your first home and beyond. But before we get into the interesting stuff in this week's episode we've got the boring bit. The disclaimer. You of course know that nothing in this podcast is to be taken as personal advice. We always recommend getting the advice of an expert in their field who takes the time to understand your personal situation. We've done our very best to ensure that the content is correct at the time of recording. Things change rapidly, so always check with the relevant government authority and your trusted advisors to get the most up-to-date information. Today we're talking about the 10 essential steps for first home buyers. But before we get into that, Veronica, usually I have a background or a house or something. For those of you who tune in on the video, you will see behind both Veronica and I, we have the 10 essential steps for buying your first home without making rookie mistakes. (laughs) And of course, our heads are obliterating the middle ones, but we're going to run through them all. If you're watching the video, you'll see them and you'll see us moving around them. But if you're listening to the podcast, you will Get it all in your ears. All righty. So let's well, kick- let's kick off, Veronica. We 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 sort of created <laughs> this. And I know I know that this is not new to a lot of our listeners who who tune in and, and we have a lot of people download these podcasts every week because they want to be educated. But the reason that we created this, um, and it's funny, we've been asked this a few time to- a few times over the last couple of days. Mm. And it was because we know that not a lot of first-time buyers can afford a buyer's agent. And without doubt, a buyer's agent is the safest and best way to buy a property if you can afford it. So what we did was put our collective brains. I can see you want to say something there. So I do want to say something. If you can afford it and if you can get a good one, because there's a lot of really inexperienced buyer's agents there. And I can tell you, if you learn our 10 steps, You'll know more than some of the buyer's agents out there charging money to do this. So, you know, yes, if you can use a buyer's agent like Megan or I, you are way better off, but most people can't afford us. So that's why we've put this together for you. Absolutely. So this is a download of our brains in a do-it-yourself format so that you can do it really well. It comprises four phases. We call it the PACE system. So four phases with 10 clear steps defined throughout the PACE system, preparation, action, commitment, and execution. And if now, you're wondering really what critical. PACE stands for, I'm just going to spell it out because if you can see it on the behind us and you're watching the video, you'll get that that's what PACE stands for, P-A-C-E, preparation, action, commitment, execution. I'm just spelling it out because I know that if you're listening to the podcast, you might not be thinking, you might not realize what we're saying. <laughs> Yeah, look, it's important. And 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 the reason that we did it in such a systematic way is because if you get the steps out of order, you can make a really bad mistake or you can end up not buying and continually missing out in the market. So this this system that we developed, the PACE system, helps people move through from the very start, the very, very start, right up until they purchase their home. Absolutely. And there are 10 clear steps within those four stages, right? So 10 steps, four stages, pretty simple. Get them in order. And 
Bob's your uncle. You buy a home, right? Well, let's slow it down a bit just a do. little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Slow this just is the education. You've got work to do too. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So let's kick off with preparation, which is phase one. There are three parts to phase one. So that's three of those 10 steps. So do you want to go with the first one, Megan? Yeah. I like, um, you know, we talk about lots of analogies because not many people have been through buying a home, but they've done lots of other things in their lives. And and we talk about preparation being like, you know, if you put your right shoe on your left foot and expect to be able to run really fast you're probably going to have to rethink that, you know, and, <laughs> and, and buying, being ill-prepared is pretty much the same thing. If you're going to put the steps in the wrong order on your, or your feet aren't going to follow each other with the right shoes on, then you're going to trip it is, yeah. is most likely what's going to happen. Which goes so, to our other bigger metaphor, which is really that buying your first home is like climbing a mountain. You can imagine <laughs> trying to climb a mountain with your feet, your shoes on the wrong feet, can't you? No, <laughs> you wouldn't do it. <laughs> yeah. We're wearing your Dunlop volleys instead of your hiking boots, but we digress. Yeah. <laughs> um, so step one is really about having a really good support crew. Now, of course, we are glossing over this information in this podcast. This is not the in-depth stuff that you learn in the course. No, but no, having no. people in your support crew who you'll take advice along uh, uh, from along the way is really important. But not only that, it's knowing who not to have in your support crew, who might be well-meaning, but a lot of noise that mm. distracts you from what you really need to do. And and within this part, it's about learning who to ask and what questions to ask and then how to use the information so that they you get out there and you make really good decisions based on reliable information. Yeah. And look, having a support crew or getting them on board or, or knowing who you're going to have as your support crew early on is something that a lot of people forget to do or they just don't realise that they need people on their yeah. team until they're rushing to find a lawyer, a mortgage broker, a building inspector. So it's about getting these conversations right at the very beginning and asking yourself some tough questions before you run headlong into, you know, to purchase the property. Because, you know, your stress levels, when you really yeah. don't know who to turn to, when to turn to, who to ask, when to, you know, at that, you know, pointy end of it, yeah. are so much higher than they are if you know who your team are as well. And so that's why it's so important. And that's why we've got it as step one. Step one. And how many times have I looked at questions in forums, online forums, property forums, where someone says, I've put a contract on a, or made an offer on a property. Can anyone recommend a conveyancer <laughs> yeah. in my area? And that is the wrong time because they can't get you out of any mistakes you've made at that point in time if you haven't asked them the right things at the right time. Yeah. So that's the wrong time to be asking for recommendations of conveyances because you've missed almost every opportunity to protect yourself. There's also the factor of getting the right people around yeah. you. There's lots of conveyances out there, but who are the good ones? How will you know who <laughs> is a good one and who can actually help you properly? And you're not just having anybody on your team. Uh, like if you're going back to the mountain climbing analogy, you do not want a Sherpa who's never climbed a mountain before. You don't want them on their first rodeo or they're just if they're really good at actually rock climbing but not mountain climbing. <laughs> or they've done it once because, trust me, someone who's done it once, maybe even twice, they think they know everything and they still don't know what they know don't know. And, and you know, that's why we always talk about differentiating between a buyer's agent that's got 10 plus years experience and one that has only been through maybe one property market cycle. Mm -hmm. They don't know the ins and outs of what could happen and, and where the risks are and how to mitigate for those risks. So incredibly important that you choose the right Sherpa to guide you on the uh, uh, along this mountain path. Yeah, absolutely. Using the right map. That's it. That is the right map, the right equipment, the right experience, everything. All right. The second step in the preparation phase is step two in our 10 steps is money, right? Most first home buyers know that they have to save a deposit, right? But it's not just about setting aside money for a 10% or a 20% deposit. There's a lot more involved. <laughs> yeah. When you're purchasing a property, you've got a whole lot of other costs that you need to consider. As well as, you know, things like stamp duty now, there are concessions in some states, but you might not want to limit your purchase to, to meet those concessions. There's local government fees, there's bank fees, there's conveyancing, there's pre-purchase inspections, strata reports, all of these things you need to be making sure that you have enough money to cover. Some of them you will incur, some of these costs you'll incur before you purchase the property. 
Some of them could hit all at the same time. So you might settle a property and suddenly get a rates bill with a transfer amount from the, your local government. So you need to understand what these things are, when the costs are going to hit, and make sure that everything is there ready to go because it is such a shock if you're not expecting it. Yeah, you don't want to scrape every cent together to buy the property and then realise that you still need more because there hadn't been things that you that you've, you should have accounted for that you haven't. Yeah. Now, I mean, it's really important to understand, obviously, your savings history can influence how much you can borrow and all that sort of stuff, but, you know, you need to be financially fit. Mm-hmm. And and just like climbing a mountain, you're not going to climb up there if you've never actually even been, I don't know, for a jog or a, or a hike, yeah. you know. You don't just pull out your, your sand shoes and go, well, let's hit it. <laughs> exactly. So getting the money ready, but also it, it's it's not just saving, as, as we said earlier, it's about understanding all of the costs associated with it. And obviously working with an experienced mortgage broker, as you would have found that in step one, you know, it can mean the difference between buying this year, maybe, or not at all, mm-hmm. is getting this stuff sorted out at the very beginning of your property journey. Yeah. And the right questions, Veronica, I was thinking, you know, I was having a really good chat with a, a an experienced mortgage, mortgage broker the other day. And, you know, they were even saying things like, it's not just about, you know, you need to know if you've got changes coming up like you're going to go back to study or you're potentially going to change a job, knowing the implications that that will have for your borrowing capacity and your your purchasing power and also um, whether you can or can't borrow money, mm. you can have a bigger look at your life and make decisions about where when am I going to do these things? When is the right time to do these things? It might be that you need to do those, put those off until you've purchased. It might be that you need to do it and then you know, do the purchase. And then, so it's actually having that big picture in mind, but knowing who to talk to and get the right answers from. Which leads to our third step, which is planning. So once you've got that sort of that, your support crew and the money, you got your head around the money, right? And you can actually start this planning before you've got all the money, right? While you're still saving, you can be planning. And you can also potentially be ready to buy sooner than you thought you were because you've got this money step sorted out in number two, right? Um, and so now it's time to plan. And this is about developing your wish list and having a really good hard look at how realistic it is moving forward. And it is also the time to help you work out really what and where to buy. The big question, the big question, the biggest forum question that we ever see, the question that we get asked. Where should I buy? Where should I buy? And it's <laughs> it's a, an answer that's unique to you. So our process helps people actually work through the right outcome for them. So when planning, you know, it's really important for first-time buyers to consider, you know, if you're buying with a partner, how will that kind of work? And and are you on the same page? What happens if you separate? What happens, you know, with who if you put in different amounts or different percentages, what will you do? Is it the right decision? Is buying a property together the right decision for this phase in your life? How long are you planning to stay in the property? Um, we've had countless stories of people who have bought with a short-term focus and they've had to kind of try that stepping stone much sooner than they probably should have because they hadn't thought about the big picture. Yeah. And this is the problem that, you know, it, it, there's a lot of media out there saying how difficult it is to buy property. And it is difficult. Don't get yeah. us wrong. It is very yeah. difficult, which is why very we much. have this process. But what happens is that people think getting onto the ladder is the the worst of it. You know what I mean? Actually, the worst of it is if you actually get on the ladder and you buy the wrong property. And so this planning phase is really, really, really important because it is about that longer term view and how hard this property has to work for you to get you where you want to be in life, right? So all this planning stuff, it might sound overwhelming at this point of time, but if you did the course, we break it down for you, make it really easy for you to work through these stages so that you set yourself up really well. You know, there's a lot involved, but it can be done. And planning requires an internal decision because there are no standard answers, as Megan said. It's not as simple as a top 10 suburbs list and you'll be right, right? (laughs) You might end up with a top 10 suburbs list. You might. But it's not someone else's suburbs. It's yours. It's yours yours and based on your work. Can't even say it. Your top 10 suburbs. Yeah, exactly. So don't limit yourself. You know, broaden your horizons. We provide a framework that can help you understand what the possibilities actually are. But at the end of the day, it is all about you. Now, as long as you don't start with a narrow focus, like I want a such and such in this suburb, in this street, highly unlikely unless you've got an unlimited budget. <laughs> um, but if you see the bigger picture, uh, then you'll make better decisions because you're clearer in terms of what you really want and therefore more educated and tuned in in the long run. 
All right, so that wraps up the first phase, which is preparation. Then then we're ready to get into action, right? This is <laughs> the action. This is where people get most exciting excited, yeah. right? There's two big steps involved. There's step the, the next step in the or the first step in the action is search and inspect. This is what it's all about, right? Getting out there and looking at properties. And a lot of people start at this point, right? They do. So this is really important to understand. This is not the starting point. You are you are well off the blocks by the time You're you get here. You're step four here. Yes. Yes. Step you got four your shoes on the right feet by now. Yes. <laughs> you got the right guides. You got the right map. <laughs> If you're climbing that mountain, you're actually, you're on your way to base camp, I think now. I think we're at base camp. Are we at base we camp yet? We are at right. base camp. Got your support crew, your money sorted, you know what you can afford. You have you know where you're going to be looking and what you're going to be looking for. So your three Ps are sorted, position, price, property. You've set up a plan and considered the future and it's actually time to start getting your feet out on the ground. Now in Camp 5, Veronica, which is the weekly mentoring session that we do with students, I think this is the, the the bit that some people have the most surprise about is the difference between doing online searching and feet on the ground, oh, yeah. getting into properties and seeing the reality of things. It's an eye opener and we've got a huge amount of work that people need to do to get this bit right. That's exactly right. Now, this step could be tricky or not, <laughs> depending on how you set up your searches in the first place and how intent you are at doing so. There are way, There are right ways and wrong ways to search. And you can really limit yourself or get it completely overwhelmed by finding wrong properties, wrong price ranges yeah. and wrong locations. Like there's, you know, it sounds exciting this bit, but it's very easy to get disheartened if you start really, you know, going headlong in the wrong direction. Yeah. So, you know, we also teach you how to deal with agents and explain why they're not the enemy. They might sometimes feel like it. There are so many different types of agents out there. Not every single one is out to rip you off or sell you a lemon, but yeah. you know, we want to arm you with the tools to better work out one from the other. Absolutely. And while these agents actually work for the seller um, and they have their best interests in mind, it's really about knowing how to interact with them in a way that's going to get you the best outcome for you. Um, if you show your dislike towards them from the, the start, you're only going to make communication with them harder, especially if you don't normally communicate well. Now, we this was something to learn. Oh, it's so important because, you know, like, Yes, um, there are favourites. You know, agents don't always sell to their favourites, but, you know, there are times when being the agent's favourite is actually in your favour. There's, you know, and let's like face anything. it. anything. People attract do more, business with people they like. Attract more flies with honey, not with vinegar, but who yeah. wants flies? But anyway, I don't even know. I don't even get that saying, but anyway, Isn't you sort of honey? Get, get the idea. Don't you yeah. attract, attract the who flies Who wants to honey? attract a fly? <laughs> That's more the point. But anyway, we also teach you agent speak, right? What the hell are they saying? What are they yeah. really saying, right? And we orient you on how to ask the right questions so that you get answers that are useful and then what to do with the answers that you get. And that's the big thing because there's plenty of people out there that say, make sure you ask the agent why why they're selling. Oh, yeah. What, what are, are they going to do with the information? Like we teach you what to do with the information. How to interpret it. Because <laughs> It's also, important because they don't you al- can use that in your negotiation strategy. Well, that's it. It's, they don't always tell you straight out. So it's like, what What do they say? What does that even mean? Full <laughs> on questions do I need to ask? Now, let's get on to a step that we originally did not have in this process. But the more that we talked about it and the more that we workshopped, uh, making sure that we had this in a really thorough step-by-step process, it was important to include revise and correct. Now, this is step five, so midway through the the, the process, really. This is slow down. So it's Weird been exciting. but true. It's been yeah. exciting. You've been out there. <laughs> you've been looking at places. You might have come close. You, you're really thinking about it. This is stop. This is stop and pause. Once you've learned and you've seen enough and once you've been really getting an understanding of the local dynamics and prices, what sort of properties are good, what sort of properties are bad and what you really like and don't like, it's now time. If you're doing it on your own, you need to, to talk to yourself. And if you're doing it as a, in, a, in a partnership, you need to be sitting down and talking to each other. What have we learned at this point? This is really, really important because it's it's like a recalibration. You want to make sure that you really are following the right path and you're not just following it because you've invested all that time working it out up to this point. You go, oh, but I've already done all this work. You know, actually, if it's wrong, that work that you've done has actually helped you realize that you're on very, the right path. Very, very helpful. Yeah. 
So so it's never wasted, right? And so the amount of times in Campfire we've had the bit of a change of direction or we've interviewed a lot of our students on the podcast and they've talked about their change of direction. And that's where step five is so, so, yeah. so critical because they ended up in the right property for them, a better property for them because they just took a moment to reflect and revise and correct, right? Look, sometimes you're on the right path. That's great. Excellent. Good. And then you can really proceed with confidence because you know you're on the right path. Other times there needs to be a, an adjustment. Yep. And this is going to either reinforce that you are on the right path or stop more time being spent there. So ask yourself, you know, this is where we, we encourage people to ask themselves, are you actually following someone else's path? Mm. Is this really your path? Are you being influenced by the wrong people? Huge question. Lots of self-analysis to do here. Are you not asking the right questions so your search is not actually set up properly? Going back and doing that better is a good thing to do now rather than down the track. And has your wish wish wish, wish list wish list changed over time as you've come to understand you need to make different compromises? The big C word. And that can happen because you get out there and you look, you get offline, you get actually, you get analog. You get out there literally <laughs> pounding the pavement, looking through houses, and you think, doesn't look quite the same. You know, it's not quite the same in the flesh as it is online. That's that's why this stage is so important after you've actually already got out there and started looking around. Because yeah. you've got some you've got some history there. You've got some experience to then reflect on. Remember, I remember in Campfire we had a student who told us that um, this was such an eye opener for her because it wasn't until she got out there some places actually looked better in <laughs> yeah. person than they did in the marketing. And she said, I just don't understand what the agents are doing if they're not presenting the property better than it actually looks like that. She assumed that every property would actually not look as good as it did in the marketing, but was she was really quite surprised that it didn't. So there you go. There's some, some preconceived biases mm. that she had to go, all right, well, I actually need to look at pretty much everything because it might be better than it looks online. Yeah. Yep. And you wouldn't know that if you didn't get out there and have a Feet look and the then ground. sit back and go, hang on, what have I learned? Yeah. All right. Then we, we're done with, with the t the P and the A. We're done with preparation. We're done with action. Now we're ready to move into commitment. This is when, you know, we start to get pretty serious. And there are two more steps in this phase. So we're getting into step six, and that is the methods of sale. Yeah. In essence, it just means how the property is being sold. It's There's nothing fancy about it. Most properties are either sold by public auction, not to be scared off about. You know, how many times have we heard people say, I'll never buy an auction? Yep. I love buying an auction. Mm. Um, or they're sold by private treaty, which is just where you negotiate and arrive at an outcome, um, usually through the agent, but the, the seller decides the price they're going to sell. The buyer decides they'll pay that price for, and, and something comes together with contract forms. So private treaty or public auction. Uh, the, the, these two things are very, very different in terms of when you do your due diligence and how you prepare your negotiation strategy. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, understanding how the agents work these systems or these methods of sale as well. It's really, really, really important that you really get your head around that because otherwise your head will be spinning yes. and you'll be blaming the agent because you don't understand what's going on. So that's that's why this step is really important to get your head around. It will vary according to where you are located. Yep. It can vary from state to state, but also vary within a city or regional to city, et cetera, et cetera. So, so agent to agent, Veronica. Agent even. to agent. You know, we, we, we teach people what to ask so that they understand what the agent's process is. As long as it's within the, the realms, of, within the guidelines of the legislation, sorry, within the, the confines of the legislation, um, yeah. agents can have really different processes that yeah. they'll follow. Yep, absolutely. And then we move into the seventh step, which is evaluation. Do you know, often we compare our course, which you do pay for, which we'll explain at the end if you haven't um, you know, listened to one of these podcasts before, with three courses you can do about property, buying a property. And most of those free courses are put out by banks and mortgage brokers. A lot of them have these seven steps to buying your own home. Since we think that they think there's seven steps, but of those seven steps, five of them are about the finance. Yep. One of them is find a property and then the last property is make an offer. Now the last step is to make an offer. None of them talk about property evaluation, but oh my God, how important is this step? This is the step 
that if you've listened to any of our podcast episodes, we talk about the case studies that hit the news, the terrible stories that can happen to people. It's because they've failed at something in the evaluation process that has ended up costing them sometimes the property, sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars, sometimes just huge amount of stress and who would want to go through that? Evaluation is so important. So this step, we take you through the process of how to evaluate a property. It's not enough that when you see it, you like, you simply work out what it's worth. You need to know a property's pros and cons. And do a lot of due diligence. You know, asking for a property report from your broker or information from an agent is not enough. It is not enough information. There is so much more that you need to do. Um, And when you evaluate a property really well, you'll actually know how much you should pay for it. Okay, so again, some of those questions that we see on forums is, should I just offer 10% under the agent's (laughs) price guide? Now, some states don't have price guides. Some states do. Some agents have them. Some agents don't. Um, And just assuming that they've priced a property or the owner has given instructions for them to price a property 10% above what it's worth is incredibly ignorant it's not misleading on the agent's part. It's it's an in- ignorance on the buyer's part that they're not doing their work properly to find out what it's actually worth. And there is a systematic process that we take you through to work out what a property is actually worth. You'll be able to interpret information, you'll be able to use sales data, and you'll be able to assess properties against each other properly. Now, you know, this might sound a bit dry, a bit boring, but I tell you what, you do not want the excitement of discovering that you've paid way more than you need to pay or <laughs> that you're missing out on <laughs> <laughs> or that you're missing out on properties over and over again because you're refusing to do the work to really work out what a property's worth properly, right? This phase is not just about pricing of properties we mentioned earlier. There's a lot of due diligence that needs to be done, a lot of checks that need to be done. Oof. Um, And this phase is all about opening your eyes and understanding whether the compromises and problems that you may find in a property are acceptable or not, given what your needs and goals are, where you are in your life phase, but also fundamentally whether it's a good enough property to go for it. This is the phase. And I can't, I mean, we often get in this debate, Megan and I, about what's our favourite step. (laughs) And I think it's revising correct, but then I always think, no, it's not. It's evaluation. Yep. So important. This is mine. And I, and I think it's because how many times have you been at a barbecue or a lunch and someone has said, nobody told me that oh. after they've purchased a property. Nobody I'll, told me. I'll give an and example. Course, yeah, it's all right. I did, there. I'm excited oh, no. now. I've got an example for you. <laughs> go, sorry, go on. Finish what you're saying. <laughs> I want to shake them at guts because it's your job. Yeah. It's your job as the buyer. To know what you need to know. That's what caveat emptor is. It is literally let the buyer beware. Um, And it is no one's job to tell you. And in some states, there's very little seller disclosure. In other states, there's a lot of seller disclosure. It is still not comprehensive. You still have the responsibility as buyer to find out everything you have to about that property. I spoke to somebody the other day who had owned a property in a flood zone. And it wasn't just any old flood zone. It was a regular flooding zone, right? And they could have found out before they bought it. And in no. fact, we, they dro- we drove past it. They said, oh, yeah. I owned that property. And then they told me the story. And I looked at it. It was obvious to me it was in a flood zone because the thing was on stilts. I don't know what they were thinking, like, but they just didn't, they didn't realize. And so then they ultimately sold it and because it was in a flood zone. But the, the comment to me was the council should compensate people. And I'm like, no, it should not. You know, because at the end of the day, that would have been a flood zone when you bought. You would have been able to discover that and you went and bought it without discovering it, but you could have discovered it. And that's all of those stories that hit the news. Um, when, whenever we deconstruct them, they have that element in them. They're things that were discoverable, right? So that's the thing that we're really here to help you lift, you know, take the scales off your eyes and go, if it is discoverable, you want to find out before you buy not after. And not, nothing's perfect. There's compromises in everything. It's about having your eyes wide open and saying, that risk for that property is not worth it. What yeah. you don't buy is even more important than what you do buy. That risk so, and that sort of circumstances for that property, they're okay. 
I'm fine with that. I can deal with it or I can mitigate it. I can change something, something you know. Flood is probably not one of those things. No. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, there's lots and lots of other things where there's issues with properties and and at the right price, they can be fixed. Yeah. Eyes wide open, making good decisions with all the information that you can get. So and that, then, then you're ready to enter into the fourth phase, which is the execution phase. And there are three stages in here or three steps. So we're up to... Did I say the last one was step eight? I think this one is step eight. I got this is eight, a bit contract. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Step but seven is evaluation. Put our numbers in, in the right order. <laughs> <laughs> step eight. Look, this is contract of sale, which is, of course, number eight, the contract. This is what um, this is what you sign, basically. This is the legally binding document. It's got details um, in there. Some uh, jurisdictions have prescribed contracts. Some uh, contracts are prepared by agents, some prepared by solicitors, conveyances, whoever prepares it. If you know what the process is, you know who to talk to and in the right order and what information you can get from the contract in your jurisdictions. So all of that is very state dependent. It's important to know that inside out. Absolutely. And so if in those states where you don't have vendor disclosure, um, and when I, when I, what I mean by that is in some states, the vendors have to give a lot of information yeah. to buyers, in others it, they don't. So you need to know where you are and what's required in yours. But yeah. also it's why it's so important to talk to a solicitor or a lawyer early on rather than not, not after you made the offer, please, but before you make the offer because you need to know what sorts of questions um, to ask them and we will tell you what to ask them but also what information you can offer them to help them do their job better, to look after you better. It's important to remember that you've seen that property while they haven't, so providing the right information becomes your responsibility. Yeah. Like they might do a building search and it come back and say uh, these structures are approved. You need to then go, okay, but there's also a shed. Is that approved or not approved? Because they haven't seen the property. Um, So it's actually knowing what the next step is to make sure that you've, you've covered things off. A big part of the process is you understanding what your role is. Like we can't say this too often. And as we mentioned earlier, it's not just about finding the property and falling in love with it, buying it, you know, happy days and working on how to fund it because <laughs> that often is the biggest thing that people think about is how to save my, save my deposit and how am I going to pay the mortgage. Most people make the mistake of thinking that somebody else should be telling them something or somebody else should be giving them the information. Can't yeah. reiterate this too much. It's a really big one. And, you know, as you touched on there, Megan, that, you know, because, as I said earlier, there's so much media about how difficult it is to buy a house, and most of that's focusing on the affordability angle, yeah. how long it takes to save a deposit, et cetera, et cetera, and prices keep rising. But the thing is that you might overcome that financial bit, and then if you don't get the actual property right – and the contract terms right and get what you're signing and committing yourself to right, that's where the real problems start. It's saving the money you thought was hard. That suddenly becomes the easy bit, right? Yes. Educating yourself that's the bit that is- finishes, right? yeah. That's the finishes. That's the finish line. <laughs> exactly right. Now, educating yourself is your responsibility. And the thing is, you don't know what you don't know until somebody tells you. And from there- you can take hold of it, take charge of it, and own the process. And I tell you what, if you've got the confidence that you get from learning these steps and putting them in place in the right order, then you will make way better decisions and you Absolutely. will get better advice from your support crew as well. Yeah. Now, moving on to step number nine, which is negotiation and auction. Now, for some people, they think that this is this should happen much earlier. You know, I'll just throw an offer out there and see what happens. Uh-huh. What they get wrong is they start negotiating before they've done half the things that we've already mentioned. So again, yeah. just putting it out of order. Stab is I had a friend who made an offer on a pre-auction offer on, on a house, then came to me and said, I've done this. What do you think? So I'm well, you've opened the gate. The bull's run. I, I, I can't help you at this point. Shot yourself um, in the foot. But how about next time we get everything in the right order? <laughs> it's it's, so it's really common. Right of mine. Yeah, I know. You just want to, uh, I get so frustrated Talk with to people me who don't. before you do something, not don't after it. it. Exactly. Hello. I don't want to bother you. So I would like to be bothered rather than watch you do something really foolish that yes. you don't know what you don't know, right? But yeah. this is the thing that 
that mistake of making an offer before you're really ready, that is made by, I reckon, the majority of buyers, Mm, mm. right? You don't want to be that person. You want to know exactly what you need to know before you make that offer. Give yourself the best opportunity to secure the property or not overpay. Either way, you're better off, right? You do need to understand that you need to have a lot of information before you even begin negotiating for a property. And again, the process will be dependent on whether it's an auction or private treaty and whether you can make a conditional offer or not. There's a lot of moving parts in here that we take you through in the course. Yeah, in Queensland, there's still a lot of things that sellers don't have to disclose. It's better than it was 12 months ago. Um, but some sellers don't know what things to put in the contract and what has to be part of the negotiation. So again, it's on you as the buyer to know, to know, to do your research, to become educated, to know how to look at a contract and how to protect yourself in consultation with your support crew. Say you find a property that floods, right? And you haven't done your due diligence. If your contract does not have a clause that allows for any sort of remedy, if the searches subsequently reveal any adverse findings, you're stuck with it regardless, yeah. right? Once it's unconditional, if you haven't got a condition on that contract that allows you to terminate, there's nothing you can do about it. And this is a really, really, really common mistake. <laughs> yep. Again, why didn't they tell me? It's your <laughs> job to be educated. It's important to have all of the steps in the lead up to this point in the right order before you throw out a price at an agent without, uh, particularly if it's unconditional. So an auction is unconditional. Mm -hmm. Making an unconditional offer doesn't give you protection. You might have a cooling off period, but what rights of termination and how much will that cost you if you terminate under a cooling off? Can you get the information that you need during a cooling off period? In many situations- can you change things if you do find out something that you don't like? What are your options for remedy? Yeah. Mm. And in many situations, you can't make a conditional offer, as I mentioned. The agent wants to sell that property. That's their job. If you don't know the specific questions to ask, you're not going to know what you need to know until it's too late. Yeah. That's what we want to stop. That's what we want to stop. We're here to protect you from that, which is particularly painful. And then you can move forward to step 10, which is a real celebration because that's settlement, Right. But there's a whole step here because, yes, you might have an unconditional um, contract. Then what, right? After you've committed to the purchase, there's a period of time between when the contract is formed and the actual settlement date. And this is where a lot of work needs to be done. And again, your job to know what you need to do. Solicitor is definitely involved in driving a lot of things, but you still have to do a certain number of things and you need to know what they are. The bank and the broker are still going to need a lot of information during this phase. Um, you're going to have to be moving money around in, in certain places, getting ready for settlement. There's a lot to do here. And Veronica, settlement is exciting and it is something to be celebrated. Uh, if you get the steps in the right order, you get to settlement feeling a lot more in control and a lot calmer than if you're still thinking, oh God, did I do the right thing? Well, it's a horrible remorse. feeling. It's an awful horrible feeling. Horrible feeling. Well, even worse, I mean, buyer's remorse can be quite normal, but the buyer's remorse that actually turns to real remorse, because if you realise you have actually made a huge big mistake, um, and, you know, mistakes are very easy to make when buying a property because, yeah. and, and as Megan has sort of harped on a bit here, it is your responsibility, we both harped on it, it's not just you, but <laughs> it is your responsibility as a buyer. And the thing is that, you know, if you're relying on somebody to, you know, give you the information you need to have, um, and then you find out that you did you didn't have the information because actually it wasn't their responsibility; it was yours, and you committed yourself. It is too late, yeah. and that's really painful. Yeah, but it is human nature also to look for someone to blame. Oh, uh, um, yeah. So, and unfortunately, let's not go there. it is often yourself, and that is the hardest person to blame. That's no fun. <laughs> <laughs> can't see yourself. You're already suffering the consequences. <laughs> yeah. Your responsibilities don't actually end once you own the property. It is never too late to mess it up, even oh, at this stage. <laughs> that's, that's sobering. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's why following the process step-by-step step is key. And forgetting just one of those steps could put you in danger of buying the wrong property or paying the wrong price or messing something up during settlement. 
You yep. know, just an example is if you haven't got the right information to the right people at the right time, we talked about the bank needing information, the solicitor needing money moved around into trust accounts, you could miss a settlement date. If you miss a settlement date, the seller might have termination options against you and you could lose your deposit. You could and lose depend- and even more if they decide to chase you for, for, for losses. So yeah. you've still got to get this right. Absolutely. And depending on what state you're in, there's there's various protections in some states and not in others. So yeah. this is where it's really important to understand what you need to do wherever you are. And that's what this whole step is about, it, even to the point of when to insure the property. You know, in some yeah. states you have to insure it on the unconditional uh, offer stage and in, or the unconditional contract stage. And in other states, you don't have to do it until settlement. So, and in other states, you've got to do it by 5 p.m. the first business day after the contract date. So, these are all important things to know. And so, you don't want to be caught out because I know, I mean, we've often told the stories about when we bought our first properties. And certainly, I remember mine. I mean, I had no idea what I was doing. It was like, so you know, I I really enjoyed that episode that we did, which was about um, uh, the top 10 things that we wish we'd known when we were first time Mm. buyers. Like, there's some real mistakes there that. We either made ourselves or we've seen people make. Yeah. And that's a good you one to go what? back to. If you're lucky enough to make a mistake and not pay for it, that's great. But this is serious stuff buying a property and you just don't want to take that risk. So it, you really want to make sure that you you get it right. And that's what these 10 steps are about, helping you get it right so yep. that you don't make a huge mistake and you can enjoy the whole process, not just buying a home, but the process of it. You can enjoy it because you feel like you actually know what you're doing. In control. Now, th- I guess what we want to also make sure that people understand is people tend to think they're experts just because they've already bought one property. So talking to friends can be really inspirational, but it doesn't mean that they know what they're doing. They fail to recognise mistakes that they could have avoided or things they could have done better. Instead, they use the fact that they actually own a property as a sign of their success. Now, that is a big warning sign. Yep. Scary. Now, a quick note. You might think that we cover everything you need to know in these podcasts, and in particularly even this one where we've actually raced you through the 10 steps. Each step in the course, um, we actually go very deep into each of these steps. There's three lessons in every step in the course. We couldn't even do a podcast episode on every step and cover it, right? There's a <laughs> lot of information there. And we've put it to you in a way that you can follow it. It's not like overload, it's structured and it's easy to follow and that gives you the confidence that you're knowing that you're moving through these steps in the right order to get you where you want to be, right? The podcast, we're just scratching the surface. If you really want to be an educated first-home buyer, then you need to learn all of these steps, how to do it in the right order, and we invite you to join us. We would love to have you our first, uh, our first home. Not quite, but our first home buyer guide, which is the essential course, only costs nine hundred ninety dollars, and you get direct access to us to help guide you through your negotiations, your property evaluation, check your thinking, talk about negotiation tips. Now, trust me, you'll overpay by a lot more than a thousand dollars if you don't know what you're doing. In this episode, we've only touched on a tiny part of the huge amount of things you need to know to become an educated first home buyer. There is so much more for you to do. You can learn all of the steps in the right order and avoid all of the mistakes that others have made in our 10 step online course for first home buyers. If you'd like to learn more about the right process and avoid making rookie errors, become an educated home buyer. Head over to the website, check out your first home buyer guide the course that we have created for you. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you won't miss an episode. And if you've liked what you've heard today, please give us an iTunes review. It helps other people find us. And of course, I know it's a bit cringy, but we're going to ask for five stars. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. We hope you've found this really useful. And if you have, please share the love with others who you know are in the same boat. We'll be back next week with more priceless stuff.